Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we come together this morning, we are, in a sense, entering into the fray of the battle. The battle is real, and our enemy is strong. And we gather because we need each other. We gather because we need the presence of our God with us as well if we are to live out our life as His children in the victory He won for us. When we began this series a couple of weeks ago, Sound the Battle Cry, I'm emphasized in that first message that Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against what? Peter's confession, the truth of who Jesus is. The gates of hell will not prevail against the truth of who Jesus is. And what we know is he says that as his truth is made known in the world, as the truth of who he is, as the Son of God who has become our Savior, as that truth is made known in the world, Satan's dominion is overcome. He loses. But understand, the devil is not going down without a fight. And we need to understand that. Now rest assured, when Jesus rose from the dead and stepped out of the tomb, he was victorious and the war has been decided. But the devil still fights the battles because he thinks he can win. If there's one thing that I don't talk about very much, it's my family of origin. I don't mention things very often personally, but I think there was an application today. And I want you to maybe track with me for a minute. I grew up without ever knowing my father. I was, in fact, kept from knowing him. My grandmother was a wise little four-foot-ten lady who would share bits of information with me as I grew up as she thought I could handle them. And what I learned was my father was part of a bomber crew of World War II and that he was required in World War II, they were required to fly 25 missions, but he got to his 25th and kept going. He was going to see the war to the end, regardless. And during his time of service, he was awarded the Silver Star and the Purple Heart. And because I was never allowed to know him, when I got older, after he had passed away, I sought to find out as much as I could about him. I have records of his missions and all the places they went, everything he did. And I also discovered as much as I could about the war because that was such a major part of his life. And if you want a practical illustration of the mindset of Satan himself, then look at Adolf Hitler. It's real easy. The war was lost. There was no possible way for Germany to win. The Allied forces had encircled Germany. The war was lost, but Adolf Hitler was delusional enough to believe that he could defeat the Allies and pull victory out of the jaws of defeat. Understand something, Satan is every bit as much as delusional as Adolf Hitler was. He believes he can defeat God and win the victory. And because he believes he can defeat God, he fights. We know that everywhere the name of Jesus Christ is made known in the world, the kingdom of God is overcoming the kingdom of Satan. But we also know everywhere that Jesus is being made known that God's people, the church, are being attacked. Or we might say a counterattack. Because Jesus came into this world, into enemy territory. This, this world belongs to Satan. He is the God of this world. And Jesus entered this world to displace him, to defeat him, and to win back the treasure of his heart, to save his people. But that doesn't stop Satan from attacking. And what we need to understand is his weapons that he uses against God's people are plentiful. And he has had eons of time to perfect their use. And we are foolish to think that we don't need to understand how he comes against us and be ready to stand against his attacks. So I want to review a couple of those with you. The way that Satan attacks, and not all of them, but just a few, just so that we we understand and are kind of on the same page. 
one of the, 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 the direct attacks that Satan uses against God's people is persecution. Now, we've been spared persecution in our country, but you think about it from the Old Testament people, the children of God in the Old Testament, all the way through the time of Jesus, all the way through the modern age, wherever Jesus is being made known, the church is under attack. Christians suffer. Christians are persecuted. Christians die. Let me ask you something. When's the last time you heard of an all-out assault and attack on Islam? Or Buddhism? Or Hinduism? Or Scientology? Or any of the other cults and false religions in the world? Why is it that only the Christian church is attacked in the world? Because if you're one of those other groups, Satan already has you. Because Jesus Christ is the only true God, and because the Christian faith is the only real faith that can save you from Satan, the Christian faith is the only faith that is attacked in the world. Satan attacks the church, attacks the faith to destroy it because it doesn't want the name of Jesus made known. Secondly, Satan attacks the Word of God. Listen, the devil knows the Bible better than you do. You hear that? The devil knows the Bible better than you do. He's had centuries to study it, and he studies it to twist it and pervert it and make it mean something different than what God gave us. And sadly, he's used many, many Christians to accomplish that purpose. Think about it. The perversions of teachings about Jesus and Mary that are within the world today, those who, who actively deny the truth that the Bible says, those who would, who would say, oh, the Bible is filled with errors and mistakes, those who would, who would say miracles don't happen, therefore the virgin birth didn't happen and the resurrection didn't happen, those are just myths that were added later. You see, Satan attacks the Word of God to convince you you can't trust it. Or he perverts its meaning to mean something other than what God gave us. Either way, what's the end result? That you're not believing the truth. And the moment, the moment a child of God doubts the Word of God, Satan's got you. Because if you, don't, if you can't trust all of it, you can't trust any of it. So Satan attacks the Word of God to destroy the church. Thirdly, Satan uses temptation against the people of God. That sounds normal, doesn't it? Jesus endured temptation three times. Three temptations are identified. And Jesus stood his ground and resisted the temptation, the temptation to follow human desires instead of God's will. When the three temptations were over, the devil left him, right? But do you remember what the text said? The devil left him until an opportune time. The temptations didn't stop. When Jesus did not cave to a straight-on onslaught, assault, the devil started using other ways to slip in the back door, schemes and deceptions to try to tempt him away from his mission and away from his purpose. The same is true for us. The devil will come with straight on assaults. Here's some money. No one's looking. I can put it in my pocket and no one will know the difference. And I'm all the richer for it. Why, the Jaguar Club's just down the road and there's not a single person I know that goes there. I can go there and have a beer and Watch the girls. Who's going to know? Or maybe even easier, the world is at my fingers with the internet, and I have in private browsing. Nobody's going to know what I do. And if he can't get you with a straight on assault, he'll come in the back door. A sneak attack. Attacks on your heart like pride and covetous and lust, sinful desires, 
to captivate us and hold us in bondage and rob us of the truth of who God is and what He's done for us, to destroy our faith. See, Satan keeps attacking. He keeps fighting against the church. And the truth is, another attack that comes is often through the church itself, the visible church. How can I say that? Aren't all churches focused on who God wants them to be and his, their mission in the world? Sadly, no. Anytime a church, a, a visible body of believers, turns inward and becomes self-focused, anytime the leaders become more focused on their power and control and money, people get hurt. And what happens when people get hurt in a church? What do they do? They leave. Do they go to another church? Usually not. Do you know there are more people in America today who used to go to churches but were hurt than there are sitting in pews this Sunday morning? People who have been hurt in the church because the church was failing to be who God called us to be. And that's because Satan has used his deceptions and lies to turn the church into a weapon against God's people instead of a blessing for God's people. Now I could go on. There are many more examples I could use, but I think you get the idea. That we are in the world, and because we are in the world as God's people, we are going to be attacked by the enemy. Or we should say maybe a counterattack. So the first thing we need to understand, and we need to discern, are we being attacked, or are we experiencing a counterattack? See, in order to experience a counterattack, you need to be on the offensive. You need to be living your life, fulfilling who God has called you to be. We are the ones who are to go into the world as light shining in the darkness. We're the ones who are to go set the captives free. We're the ones who are supposed to overcome evil with good. We are the ones who are supposed to reflect Jesus in the world and make him known. And if that is what you are doing and Satan is attacking you, then you're ready for that attack. You're ready for that attack. Because you remember the old saying that if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, you don't have time to do the things you're not supposed to do. If you are focused on being who Christ has called you to be in the world, and that is your focus and you're doing that, when Satan's attack, you are so busy doing what you're supposed to be doing that his attacks will not have the power to overcome you. So first, let's make sure it's truly a counterattack, that we are living our lives as God's people, being who He has called us to be. And then secondly, we need to understand what God has called us to. The readings that we had today, James writes, submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. What's James' point? The devil's coming. He's going to attack. You're going to suffer. The devil's real. Submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. What does it mean to submit to God? It means that what is on the heart of God is what is on our heart. That God has dominion over our lives and we humble ourselves before him and seek to live our lives following his desires for us. We submit to God and follow his will in our lives. That's part of that doing what we're supposed to be doing and we won't have time to do the stuff we're not supposed to do. That we are focused on doing the will of God. And then he says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. The word resist has, has kind of a dual meaning. It means first mentally, second physically. Mentally you make the decision. I will not allow myself to be put into a situation to be tempted like this. And then physically you follow through with that. Here's an example. You do not pull into the Jaguar Club parking lot, park in the spot, turn your engine off, pull your key out, and sit there and contemplate, am I going to go in or not? That's not what you do. You make the decision, mentally and physically, to do the things that are beneficial for your faith and to not do the things that are detrimental for your faith. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll have no power over you. The Apostle Peter helps us understand what the devil's like. 
in the reading you had. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. What is Satan's goal? Destroy you. Why? Because you are the reflection of God in the world. And there's nothing that Satan hates with a passion, with a fervor. There's nothing he hates more than God. And because you are redeemed by Christ and you are the reflection of Christ in the world, he despises you and he wants to destroy you and thus destroy your purpose for life in this world. So Peter goes on, resist him, firm in your faith, knowing the same kind of suffering is being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Same word for resist, a mental and physical. Make the decision to resist, but then Peter adds to it firm in your faith. How is it that you're able to resist? How can you stand strong? It's where your faith is at. It's because of who you have placed your faith in. Understand this. If you try to go against the devil on your own power and strength, you will lose. You will lose. But that's not who we are. We stand strong in our faith And Paul, when he writes to the Ephesians and writes about the armor of God, expounds what our faith, what our confidence is. So I want you to listen maybe to the armor of God in a way you haven't listened to it in the past. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. It's His working in us that gives us the ability to stand. It's not by our own power and strength, but by the power and strength of God in us. And he tells us where we put our faith He says, stand therefore having fastened the belt of truth. Jesus asked, or Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? What is truth? Truth is truth, right? Who is Satan? The father of lies. Wherever the truth is present, the lies are exposed. Wherever Jesus is made known, Satan is defeated. Wherever the light shines, the darkness flees away. The truth is described as a belt of truth. It's what holds everything together and girds everything. It's the foundation of everything, the truth. The truth of who Jesus is and what he has done. He tells us, put on the breastplate of righteousness. It's not our abilities that saved us. We have no, there's nothing in us that gives us the ability to go before God and say, hey God, look at me. Or God, you should accept me as I am. We are sinful human beings, and yet what does the truth tell us? That we've been given the righteousness of Christ. That Christ redeemed us by the blood he shed upon the cross. And that we are acceptable in him into the presence of the Father. So the truth leads us to understand our righteousness. And he says, then you have the gospel of peace as shoes for your feet. That means wherever we go, whatever we do, we're to be making Jesus known. And when we make him known, what's the result? People are living in fear. People who are worried about the future. You know, every religion in the world has been established ultimately for one great purpose. Tell me what's going to happen when I die. Tell me how I can have an assurance of some kind of afterlife without suffering. Every religion in the world is trying to answer the question, what happens when I die? And because there is no answer, there is no peace. And yet when you go forth with the gospel, the good news of Jesus, you carry peace with you. Because where Jesus is made known, peace is granted because then you have the assurance. A person who was living in fear and living in confusion knows the truth. That there is a God. That there is an eternity. There is an afterlife. And it is one of joy and celebration for those who believe in Jesus. So we go forth with the gospel. And when the attacks come, when Satan goes on the offensive against us, when he's counterattacking us because of who we are, he says, take up the shield of faith. The shield by which you can quench the fiery darts. What does Satan tell you? You're not worthy. You're too bad a sinner. You've made too many mistakes in your past. Of all the people in the whole history of the world, 
You're the one person that God said, I can't love that person. I can't forgive that person. That's you. Your sin is so great, it's the one, you're the one person Jesus didn't die for on the cross. You are unworthy. That's the fiery darts that Satan is throwing at you to tell you that God doesn't love you and God doesn't want you. And yet, how do you prevail against that attack? The shield of faith. Your faith that holds on to the truth of who Jesus is. He is the Son of God, born into this world as a human being. Why? So we could suffer and die upon the cross, bearing our sins and shedding His blood. That when He rose to life and stepped out of the tomb, He won victory over the devil, over the forces of evil, and granted to us eternal life. That is what your faith holds on to. And it is that truth that is the foundation of who you are that enables you to stand against the devil's attacks in your life. And finally, Paul says, and take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I'm going to share something with you this morning that I, I'm sorry, I missed one, the helmet of salvation. <laughs> I missed that. The, the helmet, the crown that, that is overarching over everything that you are saved. That everything I've just shared, everything I've just talked about, God has accomplished for you. It's not what you have done for Him. It's what He has done for you. You live with the assurance, crowning everything else, that you belong to Him. You are saved. Then he says, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. What is the Bible? A lot of people have different ideas. As I said earlier, a lot of people want to twist and turn it into something else that it's not. I want to share something with you. I'm going to read it to you because it's more like a poem than anything else because I think it reveals in a, in a very short way the breadth and depth of the Word of God. The Bible is not just a book. It is a book which contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is a traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's character. Here, paradise is restored, heaven is opened, and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand object, our good is its design, and the glory of God its end. It should fill our memory, rule our heart, and guide our feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is given you in life, it will be opened in judgment, and it will be remembered forever. The Word of God has broken the chains that held you in bondage to sin. For the Word of God that has been entrusted to us reveals the truth of all that God has done because His heart is set on you. There is no doubt that if we are seeking to be God's people in this world, we will suffer the attacks of the devil. And his schemes are powerful, and he has had, as I said, centuries to, to perfect his abilities. But we're not relying on our strength. We take the Word of God in hand and the truth it reveals. And with faith, we hold on to Jesus as our Savior. And as we walk forth into this world, in the midst of the battle, we will see the kingdom of the devil vanquished and the kingdom of God brought to light. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen.